Welcome to Birding with Lois. I am so glad you could join me today. I have a guest I'm very excited to introduce you to. His name is Doug Herr, and I met him many, 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 many years ago, but I never saw his face. I just found his photographs because I was an Arboretum docent and I was going to do a program on winter birds in Davis. And so uh, that's how I, I met him. I looked, I looked at these photos. They were by Doug Herr and I found him and I asked his permission to use them. And he said, yes. Hello, Doug. How are you? I'm doing well. How about yourself? I am so excited that you're here. So take it away, Doug Herr. Okay, so um, I, I like taking pictures of birds. It's what I want to do when I grow up. Um, I started about roughly 50 years ago. And um, this, this hummingbird picture is one of my first funds from 1971. And, um, I and was, that's, a, that's a hummingbird? Yeah, do you see the hummingbird? No, the not flower? yet. They have, to, they have to get it up. There we go. So that's a hummingbird? With the paper flowers. Wow. This is in the Sierra Nevada. Um, and I, I just liked the way the flowers looked, and I just waited for about an hour and a half until a hummingbird showed up. <laughs> you waited for a hummingbird to show up? Yeah. How did you know it was going to go to those flowers? I saw it on various other flowers nearby and said, I like the look of this flower. I'll wait till the hummingbird shows up on this flower. Do you do that a lot? Wait for I birds? do. I yeah. do. I decide which perch I want it to be on. And I, I make sure it's going to be near that perch at least, or, or it has some inkling of going to be somewhere near that perch. So I just wait until it shows up on the right perch. Um, this is another... This is also um, from many years ago. This was actually in my mother's front yard. What it's is a, it? It's a Bullock's Oriole in a cherry tree. And this Oriole actually didn't have a tail. So I used the cherry blossoms to hide this, this place where the tail would have been. When we were talking beforehand, we, we practiced this a lot so that we'd get it right. And Dan was talking about Something about local. Tell me about local, Doug. I like being local because I can visit the birds often in different lighting conditions, different weather conditions. Um, it, it's not difficult to visit them often because uh, they're just maybe just a few minutes away. And I don't have a, I don't guilt myself out about using a lot of carbon to visit them. So local can be, can be, I mean different things to different people. But for me, it's wherever I happen to be living within, say, a 15-minute radius. There's actually a group on Facebook called Five Mile Radius Birding that focuses on local birding, doing what you seeing what you can find nearby. And here in California, we actually um, have an incredible variety of birds very nearby throughout the year. And it's something we shouldn't take for granted. This Bullock's Oriole is one of them. And show us more, show us more. Okay. The acorn woodpecker is another one you find primarily on the West Coast. Um, there are some different spe subspecies south of California. This is the one we find locally in Sacramento County. And you can probably guess why it got its name. What's its it, name? Acorn woodpecker. So I thought it, uh, it was Fred. <laughs> no, actually, this is Frida. How do you know? The male acorn woodpecker has red going all the way from the crown of the head to the white on the forehead. And the female has the black in between the white and the red. But they live colonially and store these acorns for uh, winter food. And they can store thousands of them, and they defend them against squirrels and anyone else who wants them. Are those holes, I mean, there's a lot of holes there. How do those holes get there? The acorn woodpeckers drill them. 
And this particular woodpecker is finding a hole just the right size for that particular acorn. You can see there's some vacant holes. And she tests them in, in a couple of different holes to see if it's going to fit properly. And it fits properly if it's, if it's a snug fit. It's not going to fall out easily, and it's not too hard to get out. Is this bird really on the bottom of it, or did, is this slide sideways? This is actually hanging upside down on the limb. Tell us more. Show us more. Okay. While I'm on woodpeckers, let's see. I have a great story about this acorn woodpecker and a nettles woodpecker. I can find it in my slides here. So I found this nettles woodpecker uh, digging a nest cavity. And um, this was just as COVID was starting to shut everything down. So I figured I was going to have a lot of time to visit this nest cavity. And so I came back several times, got pictures of the female and of the male at the nest cavity. But then one day, I arrived at, the, uh, at my viewing site, and I saw this male wood, uh, Duddles woodpecker carrying a white thing out of the nest, a white round thing. Right after that happened, This female acorn woodpecker got really agitated, and there's a big battle between the acorn woodpecker and the nettles woodpeckers. Apparently, the acorn woodpecker th thought she could lay an egg in the nettles woodpecker's nest cavity, and the male nettles woodpecker said, I don't think so. <laughs> so the female acorn woodpecker was reaching into the nest cavity, trying to attack the female nettles woodpecker who was in there, Meanwhile, the male Nuttall's woodpecker was attacking the female acorn woodpecker from outside. And here he is being rather agitated about the whole thing. Oh, wow. I've never seen a crest on a woodpecker. It's, it's kind of like um, the hair is going up on the back of a dog's neck. So and what was the outcome? The outcome was... The acorn woodpecker had to find another cavity. This is actually in the same tree, but uh, the Nuttall's woodpeckers kept their own cavity, and the acorn woodpecker had to find another. Do acorn woodpeckers often um, put their eggs in other people's nests, like cuckoos or something? Uh, that's not something I'm aware of, but they do nest colonially, so they don't have their own nest hole, where which other acorn wood, woodpeckers respect. They'll uh, put several eggs from several females in the same nest, ca nest cavity. So I mm. suspect that's what she thought she was doing. She, she was trying to, to get Madge to babysit, and it was actually Betty, and that was the wrong people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. didn't work out. Yeah. Okay, next Okay, so, so, so there have been times when people ask me what my favorite bird is, and I really can't say I have a favorite bird. At least I, that's what I tell people. I can't, can't say I have a favorite because they're all wonderful. However, one thing that really gets my attention every time is woodpeckers. Oh, that's this a beautiful is, bird. This is a red-breasted sapsucker, and it's right outside my kitchen window. Mm. The uh, lighting from this side of the tree wasn't ideal, so I set up a blind on the other side of the tree. And I, I just waited there for, to see what the sap circle was going to do. Turns out, he was dig digging a hole of, saps, of uh, sap wells in this tree. And it almost looks like this bird is very proud of its sap wells. I don't know if you can see them in the picture. Mm -hmm. What are, how do you, tell me what sap wells are. They're little holes that the sap sucker drills in the tree so the sap comes to the surface. And there's some debate about whether the purpose of the sap wells is to bring sap so the bird can eat them or to bring sap so that ants come to it and the bird eat, eat, eats the ants. Whichever it is, other birds notice the same thing. There's a kinglet coming to the sap wells. He, he, he's got a red crest too. 
Yes, this is a ruby-crowned kinglet. This is a bird we have in the winter. So are those sap wells damaging the tree or not? They don't seem to do an awful lot of damage. This particular tree has been a sap sucker magnet for as long as I've lived here, which is a little over 20 years, and the tree is still thriving. So it's probably not a major problem for the tree. What kind of tree? It's an almond tree. The sap suckers tend to gravitate toward orchards in the winter. And uh, here's another bird that came to the tree. This is actually a red-naped sap sucker, which we don't often see in, on this side of the Sierra Nevada. And, it, and uh, while I was in my blind, this sap sucker came, this red-naped sap sucker came to the tree and gave me some portrait sessions. <laughs> And what's the name of the other one? Red-breasted sapsucker. Actually, this particular one um, is a hybrid between the red-breasted sapsucker and the red-naped sapsucker. How you do tell, you know that? Because the, uh, primarily because of the white line above the eye. A uh, red-breasted sapsucker. Let's, let's see if I can find one. So this is a red-breasted sapsucker. You can see it does not have that white line above the eye. Mm -hmm. This is another one. You can see it's uh, drink, digging some sap wells. Do okay. other woodpeckers dig sap wells or just sapsuckers? Just sapsuckers. However, other woodpeckers will take advantage of the sap, sap wells. This particular red-breasted sapsucker was digging some sap wells on the upper limbs of this tree. And a nettles woodpecker came along and took advantage of them. That's a female nettles, right? Correct. I noticed because uh, boys have a little bit more red. Yes. Keep going. Okay, so one thing I like to do is learn the behavior of individual birds. They're... Um, Fred and George and Maggie and Betty. Essentially, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How can winter, you tell them apart? I mean, that hybrid one is easy because it's different than anybody else. But right. how can you tell them apart? Uh, there, there are little details about their uh, plumage or about their behavior that sets them off from others of the same species. Um, or another one example is this um, northern pintail showed up at the uh, at the river last November, and it was in its um, eclipse plumage when it show, first showed up, and we were able to watch as its plumage grew into the uh, breeding plumage over the months. So this obviously is November. In December, you can see the breeding plumage is coming in. Still has some of that uh, eclipse plumage, and by January, it was this familiar, gorgeous self. Let's do that again so we can see it big. Sure. So November. Uh-huh. And this is what it looks like all winter, is it? For a few months in the fall after the breeding season. Uh-huh. And then uh, in the winter, they actually grow in their breeding plumage because that's when they pair off. Okay. So here it is. Let's, let's see it big again. Got December. Uh-huh. Now, what's happening with those feathers? the um, eclipse plumage feathers are dropping out and the breeding plumage feathers are growing in. Let's see it big again. Pretty soon they'll just leave it up there big. Huh? And then in January? And is this the same bird? It is the same bird. Wow. Okay. What is this bird again? This is a northern pintail. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Another thing I like to do is watch their behavior to predict what they're going to do. And these mallards are actually um, quite predictable. I, I can tell when they're going to take off from the water mm. because they'll spend a few seconds jerking their head up and down before they take off. So I was able to focus on this bird as she was preparing to take off. And then a sequence of a launch. 
Wow. Oops, that's not, that's not, that's not the mallard. <laughs> this is, it's, it's an observer. Yeah. Yeah. Now, actually, this is an observer. The, um, this is a green heron. It's near the mallard. And what I noticed was this heron was, follow, was um, observing what the mallard was doing. Because as the mallard was feeding along the shoreline, um, the mallard was stirring up fish ahead of it. And so the green heron was staying just ahead of the mallard to catch the fish that was stirring up. So tell people a little bit about herons, because they're not as common a bird as like a, oh, I know, a starling or a robin or something. This, I thought herons were those big white birds that had the long necks. This doesn't have a long neck. Well, you doesn't don't, you don't see the like long neck. It does. Right. You don't see the long neck right now, but uh, it can stretch it out quite a bit. Here it is hunting, and it, it, when it spears a fish, it stretches its neck all the way out, and it's basically the same length as the body. Wow. This used to be the, the green-backed heron, wasn't it? That's correct. Yeah. I'm not sure why the name was changed, but I, I go with what the authorities tell me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my. This is a strange pretty- picture. <laughs> This particular heron is one I knew um, would feed in this particular area because it, mm-hmm. it did so regularly at the same time of day. So I got there ahead of time. I put my camp chair down. I covered. I put my ca- camera and tripod in front of me and covered myself with camouflage netting and just waited. And, and uh, this picture was taken through netting? No, the camera's lens was poking out through the, uh, away from the netting. So I was just covering covering the camera and the tripod and myself, but the lens is sticking out. It's a strange looking bird. <laughs> I like how that uh, one foot is lifted up. I, mm-hmm. I call it the bittern walk. The bitterns walk, walk the same way as, as the green herons. They just kind of lift that foot up and sneak it to create slowly forward, put it slowly down, and next step with the other foot. Mm-hmm. So I do have a few other heron pictures. Let me see if I can find them. So this is a familiar heron, the great blue heron. Mm-hmm. And now, does this is it a, always does it the, the great blue heron? Does it always have that shaggy front, or is that something that is only in certain times a year? I suspect that's breeding plumage. Mm-hmm. I don't know for sure. Mm-hmm. I know they always have the 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 two black. Feathers streaming behind the head. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, until they break off. Yeah. And this is another heron, but we call white herons egrets typically. This, mm-hmm. this is a convention. Um, this is actually in the same genus as the great blue heron, and it's called the great egret. Mm-hmm. And if you go back to the great blue heron for a moment. Uh huh. Now, if the viewers would imagine that bird completely white, then that's what the great egret would look like. There's actually a white color form of the great blue heron that lives in Florida. Mm -hmm. And it's called the great white heron. So how did you get the close-up of the the great egret, the white bird? That's a pretty close close (laughs) close-up, isn't it? It is. this was on December 31st, 2007. I remember the day in great detail. This was the only bird I saw all day. <laughs> <laughs> and this was at the Nimbus Fish Hatchery here in Sacramento County, where they're used to seeing people. So I could get pretty close to it without disturbing it. And that's actually my goal. I don't want to disturb the bird. And... And my, I consider it a successful day if I get a picture and I back away and the bird is still there. Ah. Mm-hmm. Well, that uh, Nimbus fish hatchery area is a pretty good spot for lots of different birds. Um, there was this hummingbird that I found there one day mm-hmm. and it seemed to like this one perch. But I, I didn't have an awful lot of time that day to... Uh, get as many pictures as I wanted. So I came back on another day when the light was perfect and the hummingbird 
was showing off for me. Oh, wow. And then uh, near that um, pintail, it's actually a, a boat ramp where the pintail was hanging out all winter. Uh, it's a small inlet in the American River. It's called um, Sailor Bar. There's a pond nearby where there's there, there are uh, pie-billed grebes and double-crested cormorants and uh, ring-necked ducks. This pond is also the first spot the Eurasian widgeon was seen in Sacramento County a number of years ago. Well, they're pretty common now, aren't they? We see them regularly, yeah, but uh, not very often in Sacramento County. So the difference between Sacramento County, where you live, and Yolo County, where I live, is one of elevation or flatness. That's certainly Yolo one County difference. is flat. <laughs> it also has more um, riparian areas with slow-moving water, mm -hmm. which is, uh, this time of year, is great for migrating warblers. Uh, Puta Creek is great for that. And if the water conditions are just right, there'll be mass bird baths along the creek. Mm -hmm. and, uh, for, unfortunately, I don't have a picture of that right now. So so this what, particular, mm -hmm. Go ahead. This, this particular inlet was also uh, home to a, a common loon for a few days. But that's a pretty rare bird out in California, isn't it? Yeah, we get a, a few of them each winter, but not very often. There may be one on Lake Natoma or uh, Folsom Lake, but I've never never seen one on the, Sac the American River before. Do the males and females look the same in the winter? or? Yes, they do. So this is a winter bird ra rather than a male or a female? Correct. So another near bird nearby was this um, belted kingfisher. These birds are notoriously difficult to get close to, but I found this one uh, like this particular perch. So I just went out there with my camera on the tripod and then my camouflage netting and waited for it. And we also had a uh, nest, nesting red-shouldered hawk nearby. And so I, I knew generally where it was going to be. When I, and then when I saw it fly into this tree, I got it one up to it and it posed for me. Are hawks less afraid of humans than like herons and egrets? It really depends on the individual. Hmm. Red-shouldered hawks are generally a little bit less afraid of humans than other hawks are, but um, I would say hummingbirds are the least afraid of people. <laughs> hummingbirds are afraid of nothing. Right. <laughs> <laughs> That's all the same bird, huh? It's all the same bird, yep. I don't think I've got a picture of it with this mouse. Is it? You see the mouse here? No. One of his talons, okay. Maybe I didn't put that one in just so I wouldn't uh, freak people out. It's a good plan. <laughs> no, he flew in this with his mouse and ate it and cleaned up his talons, cleaned up his feet, just, just posed for me for a while. So another time I've used the um, camouflage netting was when the Barrow's Golden Eyes come in in the winter. I found a spot where they... Uh, come close to shore, so I just sat and waited for them. We get just a few of these every winter. This is the female. Male's drinking water. And here he's uh, doing his floating wing stretch. <laughs> Exercises. Right. So one technique I've used is to just attract them to my yard. And I've developed what I call an avian portrait studio. 
which means I've got something the birds will come to on their own. But I've got to set up some nice perches, uh, set up a nice background, and I just wait for them to show up. And many of the birds I've seen at, at this pond where, I, where they like to come and bathe, I don't see otherwise, such as this hermit thrush. And this western bluebird comes into the bath. I think we'll do a, another show where we talk about um, birds and water and how to attract birds and stuff. We did this lovely show on um, gardening to attract birds. Uh huh. And that was that was a very good show. That was Don Shore, who is a plant expert. That's something I'd like to re revisit because uh, it's something I want to do in my yard. Something other than just the bird bath. Mm -hmm. This is a ruby crown kinglet. You can see the water splashing in this bird, this picture. Is it raining? No, the kinglet has uh, splashed the water and then stopped to get the shower. And the phenopepla is the only. The only time I've seen phenopepla in my yard is when it's come to the bird bath. Mm -hmm. This is a Lincoln sparrow. Now, one thing I did, um, I, I've got a, a, almost an acre of property here, and I want, want to keep it fire, as fire safe as possible. So I mow almost all the grass. The only place I don't mow all the grass is behind the bird bath. So I have a nice green background. Yeah. I was going to ask you about your, your photography later, but first let's just do birds. Okay. So this is a yellow rumped warbler male in the spring. It's about to head to the mountains for breeding. Hey, I have that yellow rumped warbler. Uh -huh. I have a trick for you. Let yes. me show you. If I can be on the screen, please. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. So, yellow rump warbler has a Myrtle's race or variation and an Audubon's. They used to be separate, now they're together. And here's the way I remember it a yellow throat is with an Audubon's, a white throat is with the Myrtle's. So, which one Pretty is this? Tricks. Pretty neat trick, yeah. Okay, let's see. This that is an auto. Again. Okay, so this has a yellow throat. Mm -hmm. So this is the Audubon's. It is. Now my, it doesn't Audubon's. look like that when they're visiting me. They're they're much grayer than that. Yes, that's the winter plumage. So this one I was able to watch change from the winter plumage into this breeding plumage before it left for the mountains. Wonderful. Who else came to your bird bath? Uh, brown brown headed cowbird. Ah. Uh, this is a female purple finch. I don't get those very often. They're not down in the valley, are they? I mean, I've seen house finches all the time, but I don't think I've ever seen one of those in Davis. I wouldn't be surprised if they are in the valley, hmm. but primarily in the winter. Hmm. This one is a male house finch. Wait a minute. How can you tell the difference between that house finch and that purple finch? That looks well, purple to me. Well, the purple finch is going to have more rosy color in the wings and uh, less streaking on the belly. And so can we see that purple finch again? Well, this purple finch is a female, so it doesn't kind of sh not going to show the purplish. Oh. But, but among the females, the um, purple finch has a bit more of a greenish tinge than the house finch. But I patch ear patch looks a little different than i'm used yeah, it's a to. little right it's a little more distinct than on the house finch okay coming up next okay there's a male house finch mm -hmm. this oh, is that's a, a gold finch that is this is a lesser <laughs> gold finch with golden leaves behind it yeah and golden lichen on the perch yeah <laughs> that photo is just golden it is 
So this is a close relative of the goldfinch. This is the pine siskin. That's female, right? Um, I'm not certain. I believe the female has less yellow than the male. And the male has a little bit of yellow in the wings. Mm -hmm. And I, I've seen some with more yellow than this particular bird. So I'll, I'll go with that. <laughs> well, I don't know. Some birds, they have male-female differences. And some birds, is just individual. Right. Or some hey. Cali California scrub jay. Yeah. They're cool birds. The squawky birds. I even ah. get magpies in my bird bath. Now that's a young one. I believe so. Because, because the the feathers around the lore is still there. Yeah, the, there's still some yellow around the around mm -hmm. the eye. Mm -hmm. And the white patch on the wing is relatively small. So I believe this is a young bird. Mm-hmm. This is a Eurasian collared dove, mm -hmm. which, by the way, is an invasive species. I know. They're um, taken over. They are. Um, yeah. Before, maybe 15 years ago, they were unheard of in Sacramento County. Now I see them almost every day. And this is a real treat. This is a Western tanager. It came to my bird bath for just a couple of days before it went to the mountains this spring. Mm. So I think that's all my bird bath. But I do put up feeders for the hummingbirds. Mm -hmm. And that's a really good way to get them close enough. This is one of my favorite Anna's hummingbird pictures. And do you put the camera out there or do you? Take the camera out there with you. I'm out there with the camera. So they, they get used to seeing me. Oh, yeah. Uh, here's a female Anna's hummingbird. Oh, wow. How do you and TJ get those backgrounds like that? They're just beautiful. That's a, a patch of weeds. Way out I of know, focus. but it's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's all smooth green and, and it sets off the bird so nicely. That's something I look for in my photographs. I try to arrange myself so that uh, when the bird is on the perch I want or the bird is flying where I want it, it's going to have a nice background. And then how do you make the background be that shaded green rather than being individual leaves or stuff? Well, that's an unavoidable uh, aspect of the optics of the lens. The lens has a limited depth of field. And so there's only a, technically there's only a single plane that is in focus, but the bird is near enough to that plane or the, that it seems to be in focus. So it's, but the background is so far away that it's so far out of focus, you can't see any detail at all. And is that a characteristic of uh, digital or film or it doesn't make any difference? The reception, it's just the lens in front. Yeah, the optics of the lens. I like the purple ring on this one. This one's a, a black-chinned hummingbird. It doesn't Which show that I always purple. thought was a really silly name for it because, yes, it does have a black chin, but then it's got this purple collar. It's like, eh. Now, one thing we really need to do is name these birds so that the names apply to both the male and the female, mm -hmm. because the female doesn't have a black chin. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to see that change. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> I'd like to see the house finch called a, an American linnet, but that's not going to happen. Okay. Ooh, that one's a rusty color. This is a rufous hummingbird, and this was a bird that showed up one fall at my bird feeder. And um, if you know Rufus hummingbirds at all, you can guess what happened to the uh, scene at the hummingbird feeder. Uh, big fight? Big fight. You're right. Yeah. Rufus hummingbird said, this is my feeder. No one else can feed here. And uh, any time any other hummingbird wanted to come up and feed from the feeder, the, humming, the Rufus hummingbird said, nope, and chased it away. 
On the, the left edge of that, on the belly, I see a black line. Is that actually a black line or is that something else? I think this is shading. As in shadow like the sun was behind it or something? Like the, No, the sun is more to the birds, behind the bird and to the bird's left. So then you so, must have had a flash. No, this is just, uh, it's because the bird is round. <laughs> <laughs> it's basically because the bird is round yeah, and i know but if the light's behind it and it's so brightly lit this is incredible it, the light wasn't directly behind me it was off to my side and behind me oh, so behind that's you. why you, ah, yeah yeah I thought you're saying it was behind the bird yeah oh, oh, so okay. are, are rufus hummingbirds male and females different also yes you won't see the red throat on the female <laughs> it's a gorget Oh, you're right. You're right. Gorget. Yeah, um, I love I love those gorgets. Now, when this bird first showed up in the fall, it was an immature male. And it was the first time I'd ever seen a Rufus hummingbird in my yard. And it, uh, it stayed for a couple of weeks, terrorizing all the other hummingbirds. Except that some of the hummingbirds realized that when one hummingbird comes up to feed and the rufous hummingbird chases it away, <laughs> <laughs> the rufous hummingbird is gone. So they can sneak a sip. Yeah. My husband uh, has hummingbird feeder just outside his front office. And so he watches them and he and there and there's a bush right at his at one of the windows. So about six inches away from the window, there's a little twig. And one of the black tin hummingbirds used to come and just hang out there and wait for the anise hummingbirds to have a fight. And then go take us. <laughs> They're smart birds. <laughs> now, this, um, this picture actually is an adult male. And it says, I believe it's the same bird that came back the following spring. I've never it seen a It looks identical. Well, except that this is adult plumage. And the one in the fall, I don't have Show a picture me. of the fall bird. Oh, 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 I see. I don't have a, but this, is, this is the adult bird. Um, I'd never seen a rufous hummingbird in my yard before that fall plumage come, one came up. Mm -hmm. And I've never seen one since this spring one the following spring. So I have to believe it's the same bird. Okay, you're talking about getting to know a bird, going and sitting out and being someplace for an hour and a half and or draping yourself in camouflage so that you can get the right shot and stuff. Is this what you do professionally? Because, I mean, hey, you spend an awful lot of time taking pictures of birds. Well, I am a retired mechanical engineer. I worked for the State Energy Commission for a number of years and retired about eight years ago. And so once I retired, I decided I, I wanted to do uh, a lot more photography. I still say it's what I want to do when I grow up. As if you'll ever grow up? <laughs> right, right. Okay, what else you get to show us? Okay, sometimes I don't have to use the camouflage. I just sit and wait until I become part of the background scenery. So what's and this bird? This is a cute bird. This is a female California quail. Mm -hmm. And that little, that little top knot. Oh, a big this is top the male. knot. Yeah, this is a male. And you sit long enough, you just become part of the background scenery. They start ignoring you. Mm -hmm. I'm used to seeing these scurrying around in the grass. It's odd to see them in a tree. Yeah. Well, they actually perch in trees overnight. Is that a gorget on that, the gray part that's on the side? I, I wouldn't call it a gorget. I think it's, it's solid black. It doesn't flash any colors. Oh, I didn't mean that part. I mean, if you look on the right-hand edge, there's some streaky gray feathers that look like they're attached to the head but turning. Yeah, I, I'm not sure what it'll be called. I just call it cool feathers. <laughs> Very pretty. So this is another one. I, which I just sat and waited for the bird to show up on the right perch. Is that another goldfinch? It is a lesser goldfinch. And I saw a flock of them on this 
plant which I believe is called a Brazilian Bervain, which is not native, but the goldfinches like to feed on it. And so I saw this flock of goldfinches feeding on it, and I noticed that this that occasionally came to this particular part of the plant. So I sat that I, where I could get a nice background, and I just waited. Mm -hmm. Another cool place I use nearby is wildlife refuges. And we have a great one nearby. It's called the Yolo Bypass Wildlife Area. And uh, a good area is for the uh, American bittern and cattle egret. And our friend the green heron again. Oh, now there it's got a neck. Yeah. Yeah. And in the winter, there's, it's a great area for raptors, such as this immature red-shouldered hawk. And just a few weeks ago, the, the uh, refuge managers had mowed the fields preparing for this, the winter. Mm -hmm. And um, Swainson's hawks took notice. With the fields all mowed, the, the mice and the grasshoppers and the snakes were all exposed and easy pickings for their migration south. I want the viewers to note um, the wing pattern and colors. In other words, a light front edge. No, no, keep that side up. A light front edge and a darker back edge. And this is exactly opposite of the turkey vultures, which has a dark front and a lighter back. And so when the bird is soaring overhead and you don't know what it was and it doesn't have a red tail, look for that wing pattern. That's a good thing to work, look for. It's very distinctive on this bird. Mm -hmm. But isn't this the bird that has lots of different uh, color patterns, like a solid charcoal or something like that? They can have several different color patterns. Yeah, that's pretty common among the Budio hawks, such as this Budio Swainsoni. Um, Red-tailed hawks will do that. Um, Swainson's hawks, uh, rough-legged hawks, they have dark color forms and light color forms and intermediate color forms. So it can be tricky by identifying them, but there are a few identifying features that are common among all those color forms. Such as? Such as uh, with a red-tailed hawk, the leading edge of the wing on the underside is always dark. That's called a dark patagial mark. And a red-tailed hawk is always going to have some kind of um, band of streaks across the belly which we call a belly band. Do you have a picture of a red tail? I'm, I don't think I have one flying. You can see the belly band if they're sitting down too. Yeah, let me see if I have that. The picture I'm thinking of was actually in my neighbor's pasture. <laughs> so you live out in the country, not right in downtown Sacramento, right? Right. My next door neighbor has about a three or four acre pasture that um, is just wildlife area right now. I see coyotes occasionally. Um, there are lots of birds fly over or fly into the pasture or from the pasture into my yard. I believe I've seen about 70 species of birds in my yard. What, you don't have a yard list? You don't have a record? I thought birders made lists of everything. <laughs> Well, I do have a list of that, but I don't have the number memorized. <laughs> I have to recount every time. <laughs> so another another raptor I find in the Yellow Bypass Wildlife Area is this red, this uh, northern harrier, and you can see here it uh, found itself a coot. Mm -hmm. White-tailed kites—they're pretty common out there. I thought they got their name changed to black shouldered kite. Did they change they were, it back? Yes, they were changed it back. Um, the powers that be um, occasionally lump species together or split them depending on the latest research on uh, genetics or uh, hybridization or uh, distinctive habitats. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what uh, criteria they use, but this is now considered a separate species from the black shouldered kite. Peregrine falcons are found out there quite often. That's a 
That's pretty. That's a Western meadowlark. Can you sing its song? I can't. I can't either, no. When I was a child growing up in uh, Backwoods, Michigan, and I'd, I'd walk to school every day, and the Eastern Meadowlark was there, and I learned that song real well. I could communicate with them. I could just have conversations all over the place. But when I got out here, that song didn't work anymore. <laughs> yeah, Western um, ones have had a different song. <laughs> the song is one of the best ways to distinguish the two species. In fact, um, when this Western Meadowlark was first described by uh, Western science, it was thought to be the same bird as the eastern meadowlark, so they kind of neglected it. Mm -hmm. But when they realized it was a separate species, they did, named it Sternella neglecta because they <laughs> neglected it for a while. Yeah. The yellow bypass floods in the winter, and so you get a lot of shorebirds there, like this black neck stilt or American avocet. And I forget which phalarope this is. Is this red-necked phalarope? No, I don't know. I would have to Those look are the up. ones that swim, swing in, swim in circles. Right. Yeah. And this is a long-billed dowager. It's got, um, I think this picture was actually in August, so it still has some of its breeding plumage. It hasn't gone quite into all the winter plumage, which is much more gray. Uh, this is a Wilson snipe. You ever gone on a snipe hunt? That's a loaded question. <laughs> <laughs> this is the bird you were looking for. <laughs> no, actually, I I uh, I knew what a snipe hunt was before anybody tried to lure me into doing that. And for those listeners who are too young and don't know what a snipe hunt is, are you going to explain it, Doug, or am I? <laughs> I'm not sure I could explain it properly because <laughs> it's a way of trying to lure people out in the woods and get the better of them. You tell them that they're that they're supposed to go hunt for snipe, and you 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 get them to go out in the dark and stumble around and be ridiculous. That's pretty much what I remember doing. <laughs> and a, there weren't snipe where I grew up, and b. They're not nocturnal. You're not going to catch a <laughs> snipe that way. You don't want to see a snipe that way. Right. <laughs> yeah. The white-faced ibis is pretty common out there in the summer. And uh, this is the summer breeding plumage with the white face and more glossy plumage. And, it is uh, such a strange name for that bird. I mean, a white-faced ibis. That Right. <laughs> it's like what? So there's a little tiny line of white, and only at certain times of the year. Right. Yeah. Marsh runs are really common out there. Now there's a bird that has a, a a good voice. Such a tiny little bird and such a big voice. And occasionally I see barn owls out there too. Oh really? Yeah. On the ground. That's weird. Yeah. I always see them in trees. Or flying. If you see them at all. <laughs> yeah. So I'll hear a few more from my yard, actually. This is in my front yard. Oh. Uh, every year, the cedar waxwings come and eat these berries off this tree. Uh, but it's never really predictable exactly what it's going to be. They're there for maybe a day or two until they clean out the berries and they're gone. Mm -hmm. And this is actually a very uh, useful photo because you can actually see those little tiny red bits. That's the wax on the wax wing, which isn't really sealing wax. It's just a growth on the bird. Yeah. And they break off frequently, so they aren't there all the time. This is also a very common bird, but it's, it's called the California towhee. Brown towhee? Brown used, towhee? Used to be called brown towhee. Um, it was split from the canyon towhee of the desert southwest. So this is a unique California bird. Mm -hmm. Bush tits are a lot of fun to watch. You hardly oh, no. ever see just one. No, always in a little flock. Right. Even when they nest. Even when they nest. Have you ever seen a, a bush tit nest? I have. 
it's, it's a, we we saw one and it was like it was like somebody was trying to to make a a sock hanging off a tree branch mm -hmm. and and yet when we went and looked at it it was all moving and lumping and things coming you know it's like <laughs> well there was a lot of birds in there <laughs> This one was actually attracted to my bird bath. Oh, good. They're so light, they can take baths on leaves. Yeah. And now that's a bird the, we never have here. You don't have the oak tip mouse? Not in Davis. Oh, that's too bad. Have to go up in, in the, well, Yolo County does have a few foothills up in Cape Valley and, uh -huh. you know, up that way, but not down here. Oh, yeah, this is one of my little favorites in my yard. Mm -hmm. Now, is the point on that really a point, or is that just the way the picture looks? On the head? Yeah. Yeah, this, uh, it actually has a little crest. Mm -hmm. Is it one of those things that it only shows it to you when it's excited, or is that just a, a normal part it, of it? It's a normal part of it. it. I see it most of the time. Good. It's actually a relative of the chickadees. Mm -hmm. And his, his voice is very similar to the chickadees. And male and female, same or different? Uh, this one is a male because the eye is dark. Mm. Oh, I'm sorry. That, that, was the, that was the bush tit. The bush tit, uh, the male is, has a dark eye. The female has a golden eye. Uh, and okay. the What's the one with the red eye? A titmouse? Oh, I mean, titmouse, no, yeah. yes, yes. No, 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 the titmouse, what are we talking about? The bird with the red eye. It's a titmouse, yeah. Not huh, a bush tit, well, but a titmouse. Well, this, this titmouse doesn't have a red eye. Um, well, but it's a different breed of titmouse. Oh, okay, maybe so. I would have to look it up. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Even Doug has to look something yeah. up. I am amazed. <laughs> <laughs> Well, okay. No, no matter how expert anyone is, it's bound to be someone else who's more expert. <laughs> well, these have been wonderful slides, but why don't we just chat for a little bit and sure and leave those slides to go? Why is that a that's an Oakland titmouse? Oak, Oak titmouse. Oak titmouse. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So. Um, what are you doing with all your photos? Have you, I mean, are you, have you got a business or are you just having fun? Or? Um, I'm primarily having fun. If I'm not having fun, I don't want to do it. <laughs> but I know you have a website, don't you? Yes, I do. What is it? It's wildlightphoto.com. Wild, W-I-L-D, light, L-I-G-H-T-A, photos. Wild light photos. Without the S at the end. Photo.com. Yes. Okay, singular. All right. And if people want to see some of your pictures, do you have a, a collection up there or maybe on Flickr or someplace else that they can go and look at your beautiful pictures? They're primarily on my website. Uh -huh. uh, okay. I, I do post them occasionally on my um, Facebook page, but the vast majority of them are going to be on the website. Mm -hmm. I also uh, upload them to a couple of uh, stock photo agencies. Uh, so I, I sell a few occasionally. Hmm. Um, it is, you know, it is actually possible to make a small fortune with wildlife photography if you start with a large fortune. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that is an old joke, man. That is such an old joke. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I would never expect. These days, I would not expect a photographer to actually be able to make money with wildlife photos. Now, if, you're, if you're hiring out to do weddings or something, that's different. But. It's difficult, but there are some people who are doing it. Mm -hmm. um, it takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of different revenue streams, uh, but it is po certainly possible. Mm -hmm. uh, revenue streams would, would include the stock agencies, um, books. Uh, leading tours, uh, speaking mm -hmm. engagements, mm -hmm. uh, things like that. So are you doing any speaking engagements, leading tours, printing books, anything? 
Um, I printed a book a number of years ago. I might do another one, but I have to get an idea for it first. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I can't just, just print the pictures. Um, at this point, I have not done any tours. Well, I, I take that back. I did one a few years ago for someone who wanted to learn my techniques, and it worked out pretty well. And um, I have not done any speaking engagements, but I'm open to it. Well, you're here. As so. long as I'm making, as long as I'm having fun at it, that's what matters. That's that's very true. If someone is interested in learning more about birds and photographing birds and that sort of thing, are there any groups in the area that do like bird walks or something that would be ways to learn, just to go and hang out and watch people and learn? The local Audubon chapters are a good way to learn about the birds. Mm -hmm. There's a Sacramento Audubon Society, and I believe there's a Yolo Audubon Society mm -hmm. as well. And they lead uh, tours. They're very helpful. They help uh, newcomers identify the birds and, and learn how to find them. So that's something I would recommend. There's also um, an app you can get for your phone called Merlin. It's completely free, and it's, it has good identification tips and range maps and vocalizations. And it can actually identify birds from a picture or from their sound. Wow. Yeah, those apps have, have really jazzed things up. They have. We got, we got I, um, iBird Pro mm -hmm. years ago, and it's wonderful, and I love it. But there's so many more out there now, and I'm not sure iBird Pro could take a call and tell you what the bird was, but maybe it could. I don't know. Yeah. I, I grew up using books. I mean, when I was young, it was Peterson's Field Guide. And then when we moved to California, and <laughs> I had known all the birds in Backwoods, Michigan, where we lived up by Canada. Uh -huh. I knew them all. As a child, I grew up as, you know, enjoying nature. We moved to California. I didn't know any of them. <laughs> I didn't know the trees. I didn't know. It was. Well, that's, that's kind of leads into how I got into this in the first place. Because when I was a child, my parents noticed my interest in birds, and they bought me numerous bird books, um, one of which was Peterson's Western Field Guide. Mm -hmm. But uh, the birds, the pictures, the books with all the pictures of birds were of Eastern birds. They weren't the birds I was seeing in my yard or in my playgrounds. And I wanted to see pictures of the Western birds. And so I decided I had to make them myself. And that's you how mean I got started. Drawing pictures or taking photos? Taking photos. Wow. What kind of photography, what kind of camera did you have? Well, I didn't really have a camera until high school. And it was a used Nikon F. And uh, the first good lens I had was a borrowed 300 millimeter lens. And you that's still have those early photos? Or this did they go them. by the wayside? This is one of them. This one? <laughs> Uh-huh. Uh-huh. That's that hummingbird photo that we saw at the very first beginning, uh -huh. right? Yeah. And after using that borrowed 300 millimeter lens, I bought my own. Mm -hmm. And this picture was made with that one. All right. Are you still using them or have you upgraded? I've moved on. Uh, I'm using a digital camera now. Um, do you want to see it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Pretty soon. Yeah. So this is my camera. Oh my lord, that is wait a minute. That's your lens. There's a little thing there's, hanging what? off the end that's your camera. <laughs> there's a camera at the end. A little tiny camera for a huge lens. My goodness. So this is a 600 millimeter lens. No wonder you can get hummingbird photos. Actually, I normally use a shorter lens with hummingbirds because they're you can a, get closer. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So um, I wanted to thank you for being on the show. It's been fun. And I want to hope that my viewers have enjoyed this show and, and look at his pictures. Yeah. And I wanted to thank uh, people. So first, let's thank our sponsors. Uh, 
the DVE store and the After Hours 090 for the production part. And then I want to thank everybody who is viewing us. I think that's the next line, isn't it? Yes, thank you for watching. If you want more information about the show, you can go to our website, birdingwithlois.global. And yes, it is .global.com because we're hoping to eventually be a, a global show. And then... And then... While we're at it, let's thank Lois. <laughs> we got a slide coming up that's got the whole crew on it. There we go. So Doug and I were on stage, and in backstage we had Alan Scott, Glenn Motto, and TJ Asher, and JJ, who is the foundation of this entire program. All right. And then, mm -hmm. what's our next? Yep, we did that one. I think mm -hmm. that it's time for us to have to say goodbye. So Doug, bye-bye. And thank you. Yeah.